On Tuesday, December 7th, Jocelyn Elders, the U.S. Surgeon General, will discuss violence as a public health issue. On Wednesday, December 8th, FBI Director Louis Frey will, Free will talk about the crisis of crime. And on Thursday, December 9th, TV producer Norman Lear will present a speech entitled The Search for E Pluribus Unum. And on Wednesday, December 15th, CNN's Larry King will discuss talk show hosts and politics. That ought to be a good one. For the convenience of our audience, transcripts and audio and video tapes of this luncheon are available. The transcripts will be available for fax transmission within two hours. And the transcripts or tapes may be ordered by calling 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker today, and I certainly trust that you will, please write them on the cards that are provided at the tables there and pass them up to me, and I will ask as many as time allows. I'd like now to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly while their names are read. From your right is Jim Loeb, the Washington Bureau Chief, of Interpress. Ignacio Bassori, uh, International Bureau Chief for the U.S. and Canada for Notamex. Patrick McGrath, Fox Broadcasting and WDTG, Washington, D.C. Thomas Thornton, Executive Editor from International. Uh, Akiro Sato, Washington Bureau Chief for Yemuri Shimbun. Uh, wife of our speaker, Mrs. Biliana Dezarovic. Uh, skipping over our speaker for a moment, we have Mauro Espinoza, Washington editor of Dateline Mexico and the member of the Press Club Speakers Committee who put together today's luncheon. Ken Jordan, sales and marketing manager of From International. Jeffrey Barker, the Arizona Republic. And Satoru Sakaguchi of Ash, uh, Asahi Shimbun. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank staff members Melissa Bender, Pat Thornsbury, Melanie Abdal Dermot, and Jeff Tarbell for organizing today's luncheon. Now, we've had a dilemma at the National Press Club. Here we have a major conflict going on in the former Yugoslavia the first full-scale war in Europe since the end of World War II. But who do you have come to explain it to us? The uh, key leaders rarely come to Washington. Directors of partisan groups in the United States have too narrow a focus. But we are a press club, so if you need someone to explain a situation to you, bring in a journalist. So today we are fortunate to have Slatko Dzdarovic, an award-winning Bosnian journalist who writes for the Sarajevo daily newspaper, Aslo Bojenja. Later this year, he will receive the annual Peace Prize of the European Parliament, known as the Sakharov Prize. And that is not going to be Mr. Dzdarovic's first award. He is one of the most highly regarded journalists in Central Europe, and he has earned the international prize from Reporters Without Borders, and an award from the Bruno Kaisky Foundation in Vienna for his efforts in the fight for human rights and democratic freedom. Oslo Bogenia itself has been a thorn in the side of the authorities in Yugoslavia since it was established in 1943 at the height of the Nazi occupation. It has been a voice of resistance through the communist era and with the current Bosnian government. It has been resolute in refusing to allow outside authorities to control it. Slatko, as he is known to friends around the world, has recent, recently completed a book entitled Sarajevo, a War Journal, which is a compilation of his columns written during the past 18 months. They reflect the madness and the horror surrounding a conflict that has led to the death of some 150,000 people, mostly civilians, and it has introduced to the world the infamous term ethnic cleansing. As he tells us in his introductory note to the American reader, this war reflects the will of people who never felt comfortable with law, order, and democracy, and who realized that they could launch violent aggression without fear of reprisal from the outside world. This war is dragging into yet another winter, and the news is not good out of Geneva, 
as peace talks focus on carving up tiny Bosnia into even smaller ethnic enclaves. Some proposals call for dividing up Sarajevo itself. Mr. Dzdarovic, we are counting on you to give us a journalist perspective of what is going on. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm press club welcome for Bosnian journalist Slatko Dzdarovic. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's really great to be here as a journalist. What is happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina today is not a war. It is not a war, it is genocide. What is the difference? The difference is that for any war, you must have a real political interest, you must have a real army, you must have soldier fighting against soldiers, and tanks against tanks. What is happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina is a war between thousands of professional soldiers against no one, a hundred tanks against none, a hundred planes and helicopters against none, or you could say an army against civilians. War is one thing and genocide is another. What we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina is a real genocide against civilians and nobody is ready to stop it. In the Second World War, 50% of all victims were soldiers and 50% were civilians, including all the people who died in concentration camps and in all the bombarding of Germany and Britain. But in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 95% of the victims are civilians. 95%. If you want official numbers, during 18 months, more than 200,000 people have been killed. Two million people have been forced from their homes. They are now refugees with nowhere to go. In Sarajevo, 12,000 people have been killed and more than 50,000 wounded. That means that at least one person wounded in every family in Sarajevo. Of those, 3,000 are children. That means that five children are killed every day. They have destroyed over 1,000 sacred objects. 99 of those, those are mosques. They destroyed eight monuments classified by UNESCO as category zero. That means the most important monuments of, of all civilizations. There are also, there are less than 100 monuments in the world that they are category zero. And for what? Because they want to end all multi-ethnic, multi-religious society and to realize the personal criminal interest of a view. What is it they are really destroying? They want to destroy 800 years of a multi-ethnic society where Muslims, Serbs, Croats and Jewish live together. For 800 years, nobody ever said that living together was, was not possible. During the Second World War, telephone lines and communi communications were never cut for a single day between Sarajevo and other parts of the country. Today, for more than 15 months, Sarajevo is without any kind of communications with the world outside. During the Second World War, for only three days, we didn't have trains. Today, for more than 18 months, it's not possible to go out or to go in in Sarajevo, except with a very special reason approved, approved by the United Nations Force. But even during the Second World War, nobody ever said that the population of Sarajevo must be divided by ethnic and national principles. Nobody then ever cut the electricity, water, or all sources of energy to Sarajevo. Never were doctors killed simply because there, there were doctors on the street. And no children were killed by snipers simply because there, there were children. And never did anyone rape girls of six and seven years. We must be clear about this. In Europe today, we have the beginning of a new era of fascism. The genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina is in your homes every, every day presented by television. For the first time in history, TV cameras are inside of concentration camps. That means it is not possible to say, sorry, we didn't know. 
Everybody who today is in a position to stop that genocide and does nothing is responsible for that genocide. How can the United States be the leader of the free world and at the same time take no action to save a living part of that free world in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Because the real victim in Sarajevo are not only the citizens of Sarajevo. The real victim is freedom, the principles of freedom and democracy for the world. I am from Sarajevo. It is my home, and I am going back to Sarajevo. For you it may be strange to think that I would go back. But this is our city, and we have made our choice. I don't want to be a refugee just because some fascists from the mountains want to push me out because we are different nationalities. For me, it is a question of personal dignity. Our choice has been for our beautiful city. We love our city so much, and we want to save it. I am a newspaper man. My paper is called Oslobodzenie, a word which means liberation in my language. The paper was established 50 years ago in 1943. Then it was also a part of the battle against fascism and the voice of the anti-fascist resistance. It is funny for me to say this, because for us this is nothing special. But this is important to say here. At Oslobodzenie, we have all different nationalities working together. More than 30% of the officers are Serbs, 40% are Muslims, and 20% are Croats. The other 10% are Jewish and others. For us in Sarajevo, this is normal. What is funny for us is when foreign journalists and politicians ask us, is it possible for all of you to live together in Sarajevo? How can they ask us this question? Living together has been our reality for 800 years. Before the attack of Sarajevo, Oslobodzenie was one of the biggest daily newspapers in ex-Yugoslavia. When the war started, we wrote that we will publish the paper every day. The war will not stop us. Now, we are the last daily newspaper in Sarajevo. We print our newspapers, newspaper in completely destroyed building only 100 meters from the front line. We are under shelling and bombs and sniper fire for more than 600 days. We have lost five of our friends, and more than 20 have been wounded in the building and around the building. Because of many different technical reasons, our journals is a real daily miracle. But our future is not a question. We will stay in our bomb shoulder, writing and printing our newspaper. And we will stay in that place until the end of the story. We think that this is nothing special. We don't think we are heroes. We don't want to be heroes. We are just a part of the civilization of Sarajevo, the traditions and the reality of Sarajevo. We are exactly the same as all other citizens of Sarajevo. We just want to save our personal and collective freedom. For that reason, no, we are not heroes. But maybe many others are cowards. They are cowards because they are not ready to do anything to be real human beings. I have been in America now for 10 days, and it has been very interesting for me to see how much misunderstanding there is in the United States about the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it is important that America understand the reality. The war in Bosnia and Herzegovina is not the result of hundreds of years of hate between nationalities and religions. Many people here think that, think that, but it is not true. In Sarajevo, more than 35% of all marriages are mixed marriages. I'm a Muslim from Belgrade. When I married my wife, I didn't know the nationality of her parents. Her father is a Serb and her mother is a Croat. This is nothing special in Sarajevo or in Mostar or in Tuzla. The war in the ex-Yugoslavia is not the result of historical hatred, but it is the result of manipulation by the people who are now in power. Who are those people? They are the old class of third petty bureaucrats from the old communist regime. We call them apparatchiks. Before the Berlin Wall came down, nobody knows those people. Now they have manipulated the nationalist feeling, national feelings of non-educated people, especially from the country, to provoke the war for their own criminal interests. 
The first step taken by all the new governments in ex-Yugoslavia was to change the people in the media. They fired all journalists and editors who were not nationalists and did not play it their game. game. They occupied the media and they established propaganda headquarters. The biggest problem of the war in ex-Yugoslavia is that the media produce every day, every minute, every, the hate between different nationalities. In the Serbian press in Belgrade, you read stories that all the victims of the bombing in Sarajevo are the result of Muslim bomb, Muslims bombing to provoke international reaction against Serbia. Or you hear on Serbian TV how to fundamentalist, that's the name the Belgrade press uses to call us citizens of Sarajevo, they said that fundamentalists of Sarajevo feed Serbian children to the lions in the zoo. I heard this story repeated many times in one day. It is official government propaganda. On Croatian TV, they said that Croats in Sarajevo can't buy bread simply because they are Croats and not Muslims. We all know Goebbels' idea about propaganda from the Second World War. He said that every lie, if you repeat in ten times, becomes true. How is this possible? It is possible because independent media in Serbia and Croatia do not exist. I've said many times that some journalists, and I'm sorry for that because I'm a journalist also, especially from, that, that some journalists, especially from Belgrade and Zagreb, are bigger criminals of the war than many soldiers. I believe this. And so it is important for Americans to understand that this war is not a war of ethnic hatred. It is a war of fascism. It is not a war between nationalists. It is a war against democracy. In this war, we don't only have ethnical cleansing. We have the cleansing of people of the same nationality who are not part of the ruling party. In Croatia, the government dismissed all university professors on the same day and then had a special state commission say who would be rehired and who would not. It depends on their political position. Many excellent specialists, doctors, engineers, teachers, lost their jobs simply because they are not a member of the ruling party. It is not possible in Croatia and also in Serbia today to be an officer in the army or a policeman or a teacher in the school if you are a different nationality. There could be some exceptions to this, but not many. One of the first law prepared in the so-called Serb part of Bosnia and Herzegovina declared that all Serbs in that state must speak the official language of Serbia. But the language of Serbia is not the same language as the language of Bosnian Serb. That means that Serbs from Bosnia and Herzegovina must officially use some kind of foreign language. In Croatia on TV and in the printed press, they create completely new words which nobody can understand. They make up new words so they can speak a pure Croatian language, not a mixed language like Serbo-Croatian. Children with Muslim names cannot go to the elementary school or any other school in Croatia and Serbia. In the part of Herzegovina under control of Croat forces, many Croats who had friendly relations with Muslims and, and, and Serbs have either been arrested or expelled. This is not the story of all Serbs and Croats in ex-Yugoslavia, but this is the character of the nationalistic regime now in power. And if tomorrow there should be a Muslim state created in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I have no illusion that that regime would be any different than the ones now in Serbia and Croatia. Maybe it would be, it would be worse. Before the war, only 40% of Bosnia and Herzegovina was Muslim. Muslim were a minority. But in the Muslim state tomorrow, they will be the majority. And the situation we are now in push people to extremism. In the West, people say that the people in power in ex-Yugoslavia speak for their people because they are democratically elected. Formally, that is true. They are elected. But the big mistake by the West was to think that any kind of true democracy or any kind of honest democratic elections were possible without democratic institutions. It was crazy to think that only one night after destroying the Berlin Wall in East Europe, there would be democracy. For real democracy, you must have time, experience, freedom, money. You must have democratic institutions to protect democratic principles. Without that, which was our situation in ex-Yugoslavia, 
The result of the so-called free elections is victory by the biggest manipulators of the people. Victory was not difficult for those politicians, the third-rate bureaucrats, bureaucrats of the old regime, because the first election after communism was not election for anything. It was an election against. That was all it was. Today, the best manipulators have power, arms, and the media. And they are protect, protected by the international political community. Why does the international community accept this, those criminals? In Europe, we think we know why. By, but in America, most people may not know. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a victim of the new division of influence zones in Europe after the end of the Cold War. On one side is France and Britain, on the other side is Germany. Bosnia falls in between. But while somebody could say that Milosevic and Tujman have been elected in their countries, nobody can say this about Boban and Karadzic in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What are their positions? They were both the chief of their political parties before the war. They were not elected by the people. They represent some Croats and some Serbs in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but not all. They represent the nationalists and the racists, but that is not everyone. They use nationalism as a tactic to take power by force. So why are Boban and Karadzic treated like legitimate political figures when they are fascists and criminals? Another thing I have learned in my 10 days in the United States is that Americans misunderstand the word Muslim. And they do not know the history of Bosnian Muslims. Bosnian Muslims are not a part of the Arab Islamic war. Bosnian Muslims were originally Slavs of Bosnia. They are Bosnian, just the same as Bosnian Serbs and Croats. Historically, they are a part of Europe, not the Middle East. They are mainly secular. Of two million refugees from the war, only 2% are now living in the Middle East. 98% are in Europe and the and, and United States. And as I said before, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 4,500,000 people, 40% are Muslims and 60% are Christian. That means that the story about the Islamization of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina is not true. The big majority of Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina are against the Islamization of our country. There is only one way to create a Muslim state in Bosnia, and that is to adopt the international peace plan to divide Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is the project of the international community, and ironically, only the Muslims of Bosnia and Herzegovina are against that project. If you accept the destruction of a multi-ethnic state in Bosnia and Herzegovina today, what does that mean tomorrow for the other multi-ethnic states? What does it mean for the United States, the biggest multi-ethnic states in the world? For that reason, I think that our problem is more than a moral problem for the United States. It is also a real political problem, because the United States cannot accept fascism and racism in Europe and think it means nothing in America. Principles do not have geographical borders. To stop the genocide and the beginning of fascism in Bosnia and Herzegovina does not mean that the United States and the international community must send tens of, of thousands of ground troops. The so-called Yugoslav army is not the same powerful army it was the two years ago. The old Yugoslav army was an army with Croats, Slovenians, Macedonians, Bosnians, and other soldiers and officers. Today, they are not in that army. For only three days, was Milosevic willing to accept a real project for peace? That was when an airstrike looked real. That situation would be the same today. Our problem is that Milosevic knows that there will no be airstrike. He depends of in, on international passivity. The politicians who decide to bombard Sarajevo and the politicians who decide to close the roads for humanitarian convoys to Sarajevo, they know nobody will do anything against them. But for us, the citizens of Sarajevo, there is no question for us about what we will do. We will continue to live in Sarajevo. We will live together and work together. That is why the continued printing of 
a multi-ethnic and independent paper like Journal of Slobodzeni is very important. We don't have more paper. We don't have more petrol for our generators. And we don't have money to buy all the other things we need on the black market. But some of we will continue to print. Our daily survival costs are just 2,000 American dollars a day. We find part of that money from abroad, contributions from professionals around the world. We think that $2,000 a day is not really a high price for proof that living and working together and being independent and free in Sarajevo is not impossible. And for that reason, to the people of Sarajevo, Oslobodzeni is more than a newspaper. By helping Oslobodzeni, the world helps the citizens of Sarajevo. By publishing our, our paper, we create the illusion that normal life continues in the city. The most dangerous things for the aggressors outside Sarajevo is just normal life, normal life in the city. The siege is a siege against normal life, because normal life in Sarajevo showed the happiness of living together. It means that a multi-ethnic and multi-religious history is real. It means tolerance and love. Normal life for us means that there is no chance for fascism and racism. They want to destroy normal life and we want to save normal life. This is the difference between us. The people of Sarajevo are suffering daily under horrible conditions. But worse than the problem with food, water, and heating today are psychological problems. Today the question is, how is it possible for something like this to happen at the end of century in the heart of Europe? How is it possible that all the basic principles of civilization, all our education, all the famous book of world culture have been proven to be just a joke? The question for us is, it is possible that our problem is that we do not hate enough is it really the natural thing in the world today for snipers to kill children on the street for more than 18 months? Is this the way of politics in our world? Is it that the people of Sarajevo are crazy? Or maybe there is a different reason with a simple answer. Maybe we are again at the beginning of a historical period where force is everything. And everybody should take up arms and take what you can take with arms. War accepts only the logic of arms. And to be human means to be crazy. If that is the true, then in Sarajevo we want to be alone. Because we are not a part of that war. But if that is true, I can tell you only one thing on the end. Don't care about me, don't care about us, care about yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slako. You've uh, taught us not only a lot about what's going on in Bosnia, but you've also should, if people are listening to you carefully, journalists here were listening to you carefully, shake them at their cages uh, on how we conduct our business. We fight for the window seat. I don't think in your office they're fighting for the window seat. That what, what is actually uh, important about what we are doing, which is getting out the truth. Uh, you characterize the conflict as genocide, and the UN Genocide Convention, to which the U.S. is a party, provides for all states to take action to prevent genocide, either individually or collectively. This questioner wants to know, is the United States simply shirking its duty under the Genocide Convention? Yeah, there's the, a there's the question posed many times. I just think that... Uh, the problem is because uh, some so-called strat big strategical interests of United States and some European countries are most important than the lives of our children. And I think that this is reality. I think that the problem is that 
maybe that the relation today, daily relation between Washington and Moscow, the relation between Washington and London and Paris is most important strategically than 200 killed people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is the reality. But I want to tell just one thing, and I, I said these things in my speech. Really, it's not on the question of genocide, only genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina is only the part, small part, of the end of all international basic principles. And for that reason, I want to say that American role is more than moral role. And for that reason, somebody must know that daily relations with Moscow, London, and Paris are daily relations, but the principles are principles. Um. Do people like yourself feel increasingly abandoned by the international community, and especially by Western Europe and the United States? And if so, what gesture or act can the United States and Western Europe do that is both realistic and could restore some faith in the West and international order? Yes, is it true that, that our feeling is that we are abandoned? This is real, this is real feeling in, in Sarajevo. I think that, that nobody Nobody waiting today, nothing from abroad in Sarajevo. Uh, after thousands of pages, pages of different documents, after, after a conference and conference and conferences in Geneva, in New York, in I don't know where, after more than 20 resolutions of uh, the United Nations Security Council, our situation is worse than one year ago. And I think that it's normal that psychologically nobody, nobody waiting, nothing from abroad. But if you want the answer, what we need now, this is opening of Sarajevo and Bosnia Herzegovina, opening of corridors, and stop the killing. If somebody want to discuss 20 years about final solution of Bosnia Herzegovina, final political solutions, it's okay. They can go to Geneva, to New York and discussed 20 years. But somebody must stop the genocide, somebody must stop killing of the children, and must open Sarajevo. And yeah, I, I just want to tell you that something like that, it's not possible without force. Definitely, it's not possible without force. And I think that that's the role of, of your country, United Nations, and all others. Then, uh, that following that, then, uh, what do you think the United States can do to end the war? Be realistic and specific. And following up from that, do you favor U.S. airstrikes against selected Serbian or other targets as a means to apply pressure? Uh, I know that United, United States or anybody from abroad uh, can end the war. This is our war, this is our problem, this is our, our question. But I, I just want to say that the United States must do something to stop today, to stop the killing, to open the corridors, to save, I said in my speech, to save normal life. Because I'm sure that, that in normal life uh, it should be, it should be completely real things that, that, that uh, nationalism and fascism are something uh, produced, not something, not nothing natural. For that reason, I said again, I think that the role of United States is to open the corridors if it's possible and if it's necessary by force. I don't, I don't think that another other kind of solution is it's possible. And uh, about airstrikes. I think also that airstrikes, it's not solution for to find find a polit political solution. Uh, the people around Sarajevo, who bombard Sarajevo, and the people who destroyed Mostar 
and other cities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. They must know, they just must know that something like that is not possible without responsibility. I said the problem is it's that they know that there is no airstrike. They know very well that they can do everything without any kind of responsibility. responsibility. I think for that reason that really five minutes attack, air attack, air strike of five minutes around, milita- around Sarajevo, on the, on the military positions around the Sarajevo should be enough. Should we change the position around the conference table? They must know that something like that is not possible without any kind of responsibility. And for that reason, I think that it's not a true that for that kind of operation, we must have 50,000 ground soldiers, ground, ground troops, that, uh, that should be another, uh, another Vietnam or something like that. Somebody must show the power, somebody must said that should be answer if you, you don't want to stop the genocide. What is the effect on both morale and suffering of the U.S. Air Force and Allied air, land, and airdrop missions of food and supply? I mean that for all of us, it was clear from the beginning that it was an operation more for psychological reasons than for practical reasons. And uh, it, was very, it was very important for us also in Bosnia and Herzegovina more than also more than psychological reasons than, than for practical reasons. I think that practical results are not, not uh, big, but, but it was on that time, especially in that time, it was very, very important to know that, that somebody wants to help you. Because, you know, I think that it's, it's normal. We, we have one, we have one uh, psychological position of uh, the people in ghetto. We think that we are alone. We think that, that nobody abroad don't care about us. And for that reason, it was very important to present your interests practically. I'm not sure that this is something different than uh, generally humanitarian aid. If you want on the end, I think that humanitarian aid is some kind of joke. Because the uh, Bosnian problem is not humanitarian problem. Bosnian problem is political problem. Thank you very much for your flour, for your rice, and for your tuna fish. But we have our flour, and we have, we have our rice just five kilometers from the center of Sarajevo. We have our electricity, we have our water, and our heating. But the situation is horrible because between us and our flower five kilometers from Sarajevo, there is two or three checkpoints with uh, 1,000 soldiers, and that's the problem. I want to tell again, uh, thank you very much for human- humanitarian aid, but but problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina is not humanitarian problem. This is a political problem. Somebody must destroy checkpoints between the city and and our food. That's the problem. This questioner says, you say that leaders manipulated the nationalist feelings which are part of this war, but it's clear that their message of hatred fell on fertile ground. To what extent was economic deterioration responsible for preparing the ground? And did the macroeconomic policies pushed on the Yugoslav government by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund in the mid to late 1980s contribute to this? Well, all that's a long question. <laughs> yes, it's a long question. Especially, I'm not, I'm not a specialist for economical question, economical reasons. I just, I just want to explain you how the situation on the on the ground. That's the truth. That that it was many mistakes on the past. It was many mistakes in uh, before the war in political and economical and. I'm sure that that's the truth, but uh, on the end, one one of the one of the results of, of that mistakes it was a situation uh, when we had the, uh, the big economical differences between the cities and, and the country. For that reason, the people from the country are are, are really 
uh, on the first place of, of, of the manipulated people today. But uh, I think that it's not it's not most important. Important that 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 uh, most important thing is it's that that uh, it's not the true that this is civil war between different the, the people of different nationalities. It's not the true that uh, it is something natural, and it's not the true that that uh, our uh, hating is something uh, I don't know from from the from the years uh, that hate. It's produced like method uh, for the war. And you probably would say no to this uh, question, which has all the bloodshed, poison relations between Serb and Muslims to the point where it's better for them to go be in separate countries. I didn't understand that. Oh, has all the bloodshed poison the relationships between Serbs and Muslims in Bosnia to the point where it's better for them to be in separate countries? I don't know who, why is it better to be, to be separate. Who want to be separate can to be separate, but who want to, to, be, who want to live together, they must, they, they, they must write to be together. That's the problem. I don't want to say that, that everybody uh, must live together, who want to live alone on the end of the war, who want to live I don't know how, there's a question of human rights, but it's not the problem that, 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 uh, uh, that the people who want to live uh, separate don't have a chance to live separate. The problem is that, that the people who want to live together then don't, they don't have a chance to live together. What is the role of the media, especially TV and radio, in promoting the war in all three camps? Yes, it was a key role. Uh, they, that's the truth that they promote, the hate. But I want to say just one thing. Uh, on that media who promote the hate, they are not journalists. They are the, the, the soldiers of uh, propaganda's headquarters, of the people in power. There is no real journalist and good journalist who is, uh, uh, who is part of... Uh, propaganda headquarters of I don't know who. That journalist has been replaced on the beginning of the war. And uh, so-called me media are responsible for, for the situation today. But that role, it's, it was really key role. This questioner wants to know, what is keeping the war going? In other words, who's supplying, who's keeping the supplies going? And what could President Clinton do at the NATO summit in January to help bring peace? Yes, uh, I understood that that's the question who uh, give the money for, for, for continuing the war. You know, the, the army of... Uh, uh, Serbian side today it's the army of old Yugoslav army, ex-Yugoslav army. It was one of the biggest army in Europe before the war. It's it's the truth. Uh, they have arms and they have they have munitions. Uh, you know the situation with uh, with Bosnian army. You know the situation with uh, with embargo uh, for arms. Normally, always always are uh, black market and, and somebody who is who is in position to sell the arms is not heavy artillery but uh, but there is the arms on the market even in Bosnia Herzegovina all different kinds of arms and uh, what about NATO summit in January I think that I I said everything, what I mean about that. There is only, only one real thing, I said. Uh, we are in the siege more than 18 months. I think that that, that occupation of Sarajevo, it's, uh, everybody knows that, that it, that's the project. Uh, I'm sure that, that somebody from European community want to help that project until the end. They want, with, with the siege of Sarajevo, they want to, uh, to make pressure to citizens of Sarajevo to accept 
division of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, that this is our reality. I said uh, without force, we don't have a chance to, to open the city. And if somebody want to, to do something, I mean, uh, it's clear what is necessary to do. But this decision is on the hand of Mr. Clinton. Tell me a little bit about how you go about your job of gathering information and reporting in a city like Sarajevo that's under siege, uh, constantly under bombardment. It must, it must be very difficult. How, what, what is the process of putting out a newspaper under such a circumstance? Yes, I, I always said that if somebody asked me how it's possible to make one newspaper in that position, in that situation, I said that I don't know. I don't know really. This is this is a real daily daily battle for professional surviving. We are on that on that shelter. We don't have electricity except that generator. For three hours of working of that the gen generator, this is enough time for printing our newspaper. We need about 150 liters of petrol. We don't have that petrol except on black market. One liter of petrol in black market, it's 20 American dollars. Uh, we don't have any kind of communications except uh, hand radio stations. We have uh, one radio station in, in our building, and we have many other radio stations in different, in other parts of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and inside of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we have now but now more than three months, we have one uh, satellite receiver of uh, uh, Agence France Press, uh, France uh, Press Agency, and uh, on the basis of that communications, we have uh, uh, all international foreign news. We have uh, journalists on the one office in, in, in the center of the city. Uh, more than 120 journalists working today in Oslobodzenia. Uh, they prepare just just normal daily news from the city, the situation in, in the town and in the hospitals and the front, etc. And uh, uh, on the end of the day, we collect off all that information in, and with one car, uh, we trans transfer that information from the city to, to our building because our building, the story building, it's on the end of the town. It's between airport and and the city. Uh, that building is completely uh, blocked by by snipers. All accesses on the building are under control of snipers. The first line of front it's exactly 100 meters from from our windows. We can hear what they uh, what they speak during the night, what they talk during the night. Uh, they permanently bomb bombard that place. Because uh, it's clear that that's, I mean, psychologically, Oslobodzenia, it's, it's something very, very important for the for the citizens of, of the town. So we print usually between four and five thousand copies because we don't have paper. There's, there's a question of, of, of possibility. For ten or fifteen minutes every morning, we sell all, all, all that copies. We have a Sarajevo black market with our journal. Uh, one one issue, it's about, uh, not about, it's 10,000 Bosnian dinar, it's not important how much it is, but but uh, the people the people are ready to give 100,000 Bosnian dinars or two cigarettes. It's more, it's more important. Uh, the journalists are distributed, the, 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 the journal on the street. Uh, we want to, we want to have just, let's say, normal kind of journal. We have all kind of information. We have uh, most important international information, and local information, and information from the city. We have information from the sports, also I mean, international sports, and, and all other, let's say, normal things. Because uh, uh, we want to say that, uh, that we are the part of one uh, normal town, that our readers are the people who, who, who want to know what about abroad? What about uh, in the United States, uh, 
and France, etc., etc. I think that this is something normal. I think that that all our concerts in Sarajevo. I mean, uh, um, uh, it is. This is also something. This is also the part of our life. And many people said that. Uh, that theater performances and, and concerts, etc., etc., et this is something very special in Sarajevo. Why this is something very special? We are the part of, of, of Europe, we are the part of civilization. This is, our, this is the part of our normal life. And uh, we, if we can uh, do something like that, this is just the part of normal life. I'm really sorry because we don't have uh, uh, too many theater performances or, or concerts, but this is this is just this is just normal. Everything is normal in Sarajevo except that question that we have a we have a war. <laughs> this question wants to know, following up on that, is it difficult journalistically to cover a story so personal, one that affects your life in so many ways? Yes, it's very difficult. I I can't say that that all my stories in the book, if you want, are really professionally and journalistically excellent stories, simply because they are personal stories. But I think that it's very, it's very difficult to be called, uh, let's say, independent, independent, and I don't know what kind of journalist in in that kind of war. I wrote that story from stomach. It was my professional kind, of my professional answer to the situation. I didn't say that I want to explain abroad what's happened in Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I just, I just know that uh, the time journalist, even I'm not writer, I, I'm journalist, and this is just. I mean just natural things, writing in the situation like this. This is my answer, my personal answer on the situation. This uh, question wants to know is uh, how much the war is the product of personalities? In other words, if Milosevic disappeared, would the situation improve or would he just be replaced by somebody equally as difficult? I'm sure that I'm sure that personal responsibility of some persons in ex Yugoslavia it's uh, very very important. It's very difficult to say that if, if only Milosevic uh, resigned, it should be Disneyland tomorrow. But uh, but re personal responsibility of uh, maybe tens of persons in Yugoslavia it's uh, it's it's. It's really maybe the, the, the key of the situation. Now, the U.S. experience in Vietnam and Somalia indicates that outsiders who intervene with armed forces cannot stay long without incre or generating increased resentment. But this is really what's keeping the United States out of this conflict, that, that once we got in, we would suddenly become everybody's target. Do you think this is not true? I, I, I mean, if we went in there and opened these corridors that you're talking about to relieve Sarajevo, uh, we'd have to stay there for years and years. Is, uh, that's the way that we look at it. Is, tell me if I'm right. Yes, I said that I don't believe that one operation like in Vietnam or in Somalia, it's important in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I don't believe. I think, I'm sure that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's necessary just to, 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 to show, to present uh, some power and to, to say that uh, it's not possible to do something like that. Uh, before asking the last question, I'd like to present you with this uh, certificate of appreciation for being here and a uh, National Press Club mug because any journalist, no matter if he's in a war zone, still has to start his day with a cup of coffee. And the last question is, uh, a couple of people have asked, how can supporters donate to help your newspaper continue? Oh, no, it's, it's also difficult to say because uh, the problem of Sarajevo, it's, it's the problem of access in Sarajevo, the problem of transport. We have our paper around, around Sarajevo, around Bosnia and Herzegovina, but we don't have possibility to, to go into Sarajevo with, with the paper and other things. In a situation like that, 
I think that that's, uh, really the, the, the last possibility and the most important thing is the money. Because with that money we can, we can buy, if not paper, but we, we, we can buy petrol on black market. Now, in the position like that, there's the money. And thank you. Okay, thank so you very much. Where do you send the check? <laughs> <laughs> yes, just, uh, just to, to Oslo Bojanje and uh, all other things, I mean, the addresses uh, of, uh, of our offices and banks, we can put on the check. To or to send to, to from International uh, Publishing House in uh, 560 Lexington Avenue, New York. 10022. <laughs> Thank you very much. I certainly appreciate you. your being here. I'd like to say again that transcripts and audio and videotapes of today's luncheon are available by calling 1-800-500-9911 and proceeds of the sales benefit the National Press Club Library. Thank you very much again and I certainly appreciate you coming. That was excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.